Thanks a lot, Vlad. Thanks a lot to the organizer for the very nice invitation. I'm really honored to be here today, although uh, not really in person. So as the title say, I would like to speak about in general Vlas of systems and how to use uh, buses and distances to measure stability. So um, let me check. Oops. Okay. So the outline of the talk is the following. Uh, I would like to present some uh, classical models of, to describe uh, plasma in kinetic theory. I will start with the classical Blaso Poisson equation that we already seen yesterday in Ton's talk, but then I will present also another system that is called the Blaso Poisson for massless electrons that describes the point of view of ions in a plasma. And after that, I will discuss uh, some singular limits that are the quasi-neutral limits. In particular, these limits relate these blast of systems to some, uh, let's say, uh, kinetic Euler equation. We'll see what this means. And uh, to do that, I will introduce some stability estimates in fastest time and explain how uh, improving stability estimates will lead to better understanding of this quasi-neutral limit. So let me recall a bit. So in this context, we consider uh, plasma that are ionized gas com composed by charged particles. So we have a cloud of ions and electrons. The electrons are much, much lighter than ions, so they move on a different time scale. Uh, these uh, particles are highly conductive, so um, they um, interact with each other by creating electromagnetic fields and each particle feels the action of all other particles. So we are considering long range interaction instead of let's say collisions or short, short range interactions. So uh, the most classical, um, let's say kinetic model for plasma, at least uh, in this very simple setting that is, uh, let's say a plasma that is diluted and uh, in the electrostatic approximation. So we are not considering uh, magnetic effects um, we have uh, the, a Vlasov Poisson equation that is a transport equation where the unknown is the distribution function of the electron. So it roughly tells us uh, how many electrons are at time t, position x with velocity v. And these uh, electrons move under this force field that is the electric field, E, that is our acceleration term. And E is equal to minus gradient of u, of u and u is the potential. But one peculiarity of this system is that the coupling, for example, doesn't come directly through uh, the unknown F, but through the density rho. So rho is F, the integral of F in dV, and this is the electron density. And the coupling is the Laplacian of U is equal to rho minus one. So uh, I just mentioned that ions are much more massive than electrons. So in the, in the standard approximation, they're assumed to be a fixed background. Of course, um, let's say we can uh, take also the point of view of the ions and uh, modify this system to take account, to let's say to describe the revolution. And this is what uh, I will tell now. So um, if we um, take the viewpoint of ions, so F is now the distribution function that, uh, of the ions, um, we can make a sort of approximation that um, is the so-called mass electron limit that tells us that the electrons are so light that uh, they have a very, very high uh, frequency of collision and they immediately reach their thermodynamical equilibrium. So they follow a maximum Boltzmann law that appears in this uh, post-son coupling. So now, instead of having the um, Laplacian view equal rho minus one, we have uh, minus Laplacian view equal rho to minus e to the u. And this uh, e to the u is this thermodynamical equilibrium of the electrons, while now rho is uh, the density of the ions. So this model has been uh, less studied mathematically with respect to the classical Blaso Poisson system, in particular because um, there is this extra nonlinearity that creates extra, let's say, difficulties. But on the other hand, in the, it's very present in the physics literature. Uh, and it has been used to describe the dynamics of uh, ratified ionized gases and uh, the study of uh, the formation of ion acoustic shocks and uh, to describe the expansion of plasma into the vacuum. So um, these two models are, of course, very related. 
but let me now um, pass to the main topic that is uh, quasi-neutral limit. So um, let me mention that um, I explained briefly um, these two systems, but you don't see any constant appearing here, any characteristic scale of the plasma, but of course, uh, when you describe a physical system, there are um, some characteristic scales that you can decide to take into account. And in, par in particular, these are related to the most classical question that one can ask, because of course we can, uh, the first classical question that one can ask is uh, are about um, the well-posedness of these uh, systems of PDs uh, under assumption that are ideally some physical assumption. Also, other classical questions are related to the long-time behavior. And this is what we have seen yesterday in Tohan's talk that talked about um, Landau damping for Blaso Posto. Uh, we also can ask ourselves about the relation between this uh, mesoscopic kinetic model with the end particle system that is um, the underlying uh, di dynamic. And also, relate these systems with um, other macroscopic equation. And this is a bit, uh, this, last, this last point is a bit in the spirit of what I would like to, to talk about now. So, um, okay. Let me now introduce this concept of quasi-neutrality and the Debye length that is um, really a characteristic scale, uh, scale of, uh, of plasma, in, in plasma physics. Uh, what is this Debye length? Okay, if we look at the plasma, uh, at the observation uh, scale, we see an object that is globally neutral because it's very highly conductor, uh, conductive and uh, each um, uh, charge and balance is very readily neutralized. But if we zoom enough, then uh, at a scale that is essentially the, the scale of this Debye length, then we can see um, charge, local charge imbalances. Um, this um, the balance is very very small compared to the observation length, and I call epsilon, let's say, a quantity that is uh, essentially this the balance divided by the observation length. So now, if we decide to take into account the presence of this um, uh, characteristic scale, then we end up having an epsilon square in front of the Laplacian. And uh, we know that in the physics literature, the fact that this epsilon uh, tends to zero or is extremely small is often assumed as, a, as one of the typical characteristics of, of a plasma itself. So the regime where epsilon tends to zero is interesting to us. Let me show now uh, what happens if we, to the system if we take into account this, um, this parameter. So now we have, um, if we take into account this epsilon, we have um, a blaso poisson equation with this uh, epsilon square in front of the Laplacian. And this is VP epsilon. And then um, if we brutally put epsilon to zero, we obtain the formal limit that is the so-called kinetic incompressible Euler. So now we see that the, the, the meaning of the, of the term quasi-neutral, because rho, that is the density of the electrons, is constantly equal to one. So now the electric field is essentially a Lagrange multiplier that enforces uh, this condition, this incompressibility condition, or neutrality condition, let's put it in this way. And you can see uh, that uh, putting epsilon to zero um, make us, let's say, um, give up the help of the, of the Laplacian. So it is something that we can already understand that is difficult to prove at the rigorous level. Um, let's say it's very diff different from this formal analysis. So the first one uh, that observed that this kinetic isothermal, um, let's say, kinetic uh, incompressible Euler equation is related in some way to the incompressible Euler equation has been Bernier between the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s. In fact, he, he observed that if f is a monokinetic uh, function, so f of t, x, and v is rho of x 
times a delta centered in V, the, the velocity field, and then F is a solution of this kinetic incompressible Euler, if and only if rho is identically one, and U solves the incompressible Euler equation. Uh, therefore, U uh, here plays the role of the pressure field, and again, it's like a Lagrange multiplier that enforces the incompressibility, the incompressibility condition. So let me now talk a bit about some um, results related to, to this quasi-natural limit. There have been several important contributions from quite different viewpoints. We have been the contribution by Brenier that um, proved the, the quasi-neutral limit for well-prepared monokinetic data that are data like the one that we just, uh, that we have just seen. Then in particular, I mean, in particular relevant to us are there some results by Grenier who proved convergence for analytic initial data. Uh, since, okay, this limit is extremely delicate. In fact, there have been uh, some positive results, but also some negative results. And uh, there have been um, several results by Antoine Auré, Antoine Nguyen, Antoine Rousset, uh, studying uh, the question about stability and instability uh, regarding this, uh, this limit. And today I would like to talk about positive results. So how to prove convergence essentially and under which condition. So let me now present really briefly the, the hypothesis of Grenier theorem because it will be our starting point in the sense that I will use Grenier theorem uh, um, for, for all the theorems that I will state. So um, Grenier proved that under the assumption that the initial data are um, uniformly bounded in an analytic norm in space and that the, the density at uh, time zero is uniformly close to one still in this analytic norm and he measured these analytic norms in terms of um, Fourier coefficients. Then he proved locally in time this um, the validity of the quasi neutral limit up to some correctors taking care of plasma oscillation that are essentially a technical, uh, a technical thing. So um, now, of course, uh, this result is, 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 is very powerful and very nice, but then the um, natural question would be uh, whether we can go beyond analyticity and how. And uh, an idea is to try to perturb this, uh, this initial datum with something. And uh, one, one important point is choosing the right way of measuring the size of this perturbation. And this passes through the notion of bus and distances. So probably all of you know, but for sake of completeness, just let me state the, um, the definition. So bus and distances are a family of distances on probability measures that metrize the topology of weak star convergence on compact sets. So uh, given P larger than one, for two probability measures mu and nu, then the p passes and distance between mu and nu is the infimum on all couplings of the integral of x minus y to the p d pi, where by coupling I mean um, a measure that is in the product space uh, between mu and nu that has its first marginal mu and second marginal nu. Now, why these distances are useful in kinetic theory? This is uh, something very well known from the 70s, essentially because uh, these distances have been used, for example, by Dubrushin in the, in, the Blasov, in the Blasov setting or Tanaka in the Boltzmann setting uh, to prove, um, in particular, in the, in the non-collisional kinetic theory to prove uh, stability results. And um, let me just observe this. So in Vassesen, we have at our disposal several classic stability results, for example, by Dubrushin or by Leper, and I will now tell that. But another um, observation is that uh, in kinetic theory, we often deal with um, atomic measures, so measures supported on a point. And uh, most of the um, more common, most more common um, distances, like for example, the total variation uh, are quite rough in the sense that if I have a delta in zero and the delta in X, the total variation distance between these two deltas is always two even if X is very, very close to zero. 
while the bus extent distance in this case between this delta M0 and delta Nx would be x. So it means that they are very sensitive and able to catch some, um, all this, uh, all this kind of uh, little details. In particular, um, if you take a data that is small in buses, then you can still have something that is icely oscillatory and big in LP norms. So this comes to the, the result that I would like to state. So with Daniel and Juan, who is uh, in a cold polytechnic, uh, we proved this uh, positive result. So the idea is the following. We take uh, a sequence of initial data that are a sum of a part that is G0 xylon that satisfies all granny assumptions, plus uh, a perturbation H of 0 epsilon that is exponentially small in the one the vastest and distance. Then we can prove the validity of the quasi-neutral limit locally in time, exactly as Grenier does. So um, this proves that uh, we can go beyond the analyticity, but uh, the fact that in some sense, this kind of uh, singular limits are so um, delicate uh, forces us to impose a very stringent condition at time zero. For example, this exponential smallness condition is quite stringent and it's natural to ask ourselves what would be a, a good, let's say, a good uh, requirement at I zero that make us satisfied. And I would say that the, this exponential convergence is, is, is good uh, because we have also some negative results um, that tells us that only an ex, uh, if we were controlling only, if we, were, we had only a polynomial control, it would be not, not enough. In fact, the analysis the assumption of Grenier on G0 and exponential smallness uh, uh, assumption on the perturbations are necessary. And uh, this is due to some uh, instability mechanism uh, that are present in plasmas that are objects that are inherently very unstable. So all these stability results, let's say, are, are quite delicate and there are several instances in which they fail unless uh, one requires some very structural hypothesis at time zero that we are not discussing like now here, like stability uh, a la ten rows and so on at time zero. So um, there have been theorems by Grenier and Antoine Auré that prove that there exists smooth homogeneous equilibria mu, mu v, that, so homogeneous, partially homogeneous equilibria, such that even if uh, we, has, we take an initial datum that is close to mu in, um, with, with, uh, with as many derivatives as you want, but uh, with a polynomial convert with a polynomial control, then the quasi-neutral limit is false. So this tells us that this exponential control is, is, is okay. But there is a caveat on the, on the theorem that I state before with Daniel and Juan, and it is that the theorem is only in 1D, while, uh, while of course we would like to have a result in 3D. But uh, the Vlasov-Poisson uh, system is very highly dimension dependent in the sense that um, due to the coupling with this Poisson equation, proving the results in higher dimension is significantly more difficult. Uh, but we, we could prove an analog of this result in higher dimension with a slightly, I mean, the strategy is the same, but the tools are not the same. So now the, this result that I'm presenting is in uh, 2 and 3D. And it tells me that if I'm exactly in the same framework, so I have an initial datum that is the sum of um, a, a part that satisfies a Grenier assumption plus a perturbation, that this time has to be doubly, dub, dub, that has to be two times, so double exponentially small at time zero. Uh, and we have to add some hypotheses like boundedness at time zero of the initial datum and the uh, boundedness of, uh, oh, and the finite energy essentially. And on top of that, we have to have a, con a control on the growth of the support. So it means that at M0, for simplicity, we can, only, we can just assume compact support in velocity. So why now we have this extra hypothesis? The reason is that in dimension one, we use, uh, we rely on a weak, strong stability estimate in Wasserstein one. And in Wasserstein, in, uh, I, in higher dimension, we cannot rely on, uh, on, this, uh, on this kind of tools but we only have a strong, strong stability estimate. And by strong, strong, I mean that uh, both solutions have to be bounded, bounded um, density. 
uh, while in dimension one, it was enough that one of the two solutions had bounded density, while the other one could be whatever. So in this case, since we have to ensure that this, uh, that both solutions have uh, bounded, bounded density uh, for all times, then we, we need this extra assumption that will uh, help us to control the growth of the supporting velocity and therefore to control this, uh, the growth of this um, density in L infinity. So what about uh, VPME? Because I introduced these systems. I introduced this system. I will not now enter in the, the technicality of, of how the proofs change, but I would like to mention that there is this other, let's say, system for which um, essentially we are trying to, to recover um, the results similar to what we know for Blas of Poisson and to have a better knowledge. And uh, for example, um, with Megan Griffin Pickering, I, um, we answered the, the classical question of, of the well poseness. Of course, there were already several results discussing this massless electron approximation by Bouchou and then by Nguyen and Coulters. But with Megan, we proved this, uh, this well poseness result that give us um, a result that, it, that is essentially the same that we, that we have for, for Blas of Poisson. And uh, by proving this well poseness, we, we develop a method that give us uh, a lot of um, nice um, regularity estimates on the electric field that allow us to tackle also the quasi-neutral limit for, for, um, for VPME. And in, a, in some sense, uh, we can recover a, very, a result that is very similar to the one that I have with uh, Daniel and Quan. But this time, the requirement at I0 is extremely stringent because this X4 means that I'm making the composition of the exponential four times. That is really, really a lot and, I, and I'm sure it's not optimal. So on that, we still have to, to, to work a lot. So let me um, point out a few uh, elements of the strategy of the proof for Blas of Poisson. So as I mentioned, we, we, we show some quantitative strong, strong stability estimates a la Leper. So Leper proved in 2006, uh, the first uh, uniqueness criterion for Blas of Poisson requiring only that um, the, density is, uh, the density is in L infinity. So here uh, we are considering F1 of T and F1 of T to be solution of Blas of Poisson rescaled. And um, we are assuming that row one of T and row two of T are bounded. Then we apply Le Pair in a, in a sense, and we get uh, this estimate with uh, this log penalization. And this allows us to have a nice control in W2. But this control has an exponential of a logarithm elevated to another exponential. So, well, it's not a very clean control. And uh, these uh, constants appearing here only depend on epsilon and the uh, L infinity norms of rho of F1 and uh, rho of F2. So then we want to apply Le Pair's estimates with uh, F1 equal to G epsilon, that is the part of our initial datum that satisfies uh, uh, Grenier's hypothesis, and F2 equal to the all F epsilon. So F epsilon is still equal to G epsilon plus H of epsilon. Then we need to bound the L infinity norm of the density associated to the all uh, initial datum in L infinity. And this involves studying how the supporting velocity grows. And this is where this other hypothesis uh, enter, enter this other hypothesis of, let's say, compact support in V or slow growth of the supporting V enters. This, this hypothesis can be weakened, but uh, let me just talk about combat support for simplicity. Then, uh, once we have this step two, we can conclude applying Grenier result to G epsilon. So, thanks to this strategy, we obtained an exponent, we obtained the validity of the quasi neutral limit in 1D with an exponential perturbation in Bass's time. So, um, that is the, the bound that we wish to have, essentially, but only with a double exponential uh, in 2 and 3D. So looking at, if you look at, um, let's say, at the strategy of the proof and the elements of the proof, you see that um, it doesn't look like there are many places in which we have space to work to, to get rid of this extra exponential. The only place where 
it's clear that this ex double exponential come from is the stability estimate of Le Per. So, so in general, an idea could be to try to keep the general strategy of the proof that works uh, well, but to try to improve the stability estimate a la Le Per. Um, and this is what I would like to talk to you about now. So we have this uh, um, extra log that appears in this uh, in that Gromwell argument, and that Gromwell argument essentially is performed on a quantity like Wasserstein two. Um, what I would like to talk to you now is a kinetic Wasserstein approach to this uh, stability estimates, and by that I mean that I would like to find a way to exploit as much as possible the natural anisotropy between position and space that we have in kinetic theory. So the pair result um, allow us to have uh, a result a la Judovich for 2D Euler. So that result could hold also for 2D Euler. But if we look at the purely kinetic situation, we realize that the positions in general uh, are in, I mean, enjoy better, better regularity than, than the evolution of the velocity because when you differentiate the velocity, you have the electric field. So it's where the, the difficulties arise. So in general, the strategy of adding a little penalization, like adding a parameter in front of position is, I, I believe it appeared also in other setting and in particular for plus of Poisson, uh, was already done before, uh, from what I know, was done, for example, uh, by Lazarovici, Lazarovici Pickle, in the context of mean field limits, and then was used by Megan Griffin, Pickering, and myself in the, in, when we tried to um, recover the kinetic incompressible in Euler system directly uh, from the end particle system. But for, for what I know, um, that was it in the sense the only kind of uh, penalization was adding a, a parameter and then optimizing with respect to that parameter. That was already an improvement with respect to, to what was available. Here, the idea is different. The idea is to um, do a Gromwell type estimate on a, on a different quantity. So we want to introduce this quantity Q of T that is uh, very similar to Wasserstein two distance uh, where now Xi and Bi are the characteristics associated to the solutions uh, Fi. So Xi dot is Vi and Vi dot is Bi, so the standard uh, characteristic system. And now we penalize these positions um, with a function, lambda of t, that is a function of Q of t itself. So it depends on time, but also it depends uh, in a nonlinear and implicit way uh, by Q of t. So uh, this is a very general, um, a very, very general uh, situation in the sense that uh, depending by what you want to prove, you may decide to, to select a certain lambda of t. In, in our setting, uh, a right choice is to look at a log. So we, we are in the regime where Q of zero is very small because that is the regime where this stability is interesting. And then, so we assume Q of zero small. Then we select lambda of T to be modulus of log of Q of T. And now we have an, uh, this, this um, Q of T on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And we have to prove uh, that Q of T is well-defined. And in particular, we also need to prove that it's differentiable because we have to do all sorts of manipulation on this, uh, on this quantity. So once we do that, uh, we have a quantity that is not a distance, but on which we can, we can do computations. And that looks like Wasserstein 2 enough to allow us to, to, to have some comparison. So some estimates that are compatible, let's say with Wasserstein 2. So the idea is then having estimates in, in Q of T that translates in estimates in Wasserstein 2. And uh, by doing that, this is the kind of estimate that I obtained. So we, I obtained that the Wasserstein 2 distance between the two solution at MT square is equal to 2 to the exponential of this big, let's say, uh, sequence of square root of log log uh, 
uh, so on. So I know that this doesn't look very, let's say, uh, very clear. So the, the kind of improvement doesn't look very clear as it is in this estimate. But just to understand a bit, assume that your initial datum is very small, that is the, the relevant regime. So if you then apply the pair estimate, then you could have a good control. So the vast extent to distance between the two solutions at time t is essentially is, um, of scale smaller than one for a time that is log of log of theta. While this bound allows me uh, to prolong this time, and now we only have to, we, we, we can have a time of that is square root of log theta. So uh, that's, that's a kind of improvement. Now, uh, I would say that this is uh, essentially uh, the kind of improvement that, uh, that I would love to have because uh, since we are dealing with densities, uh, densities that are in L infinity, the best we have is that the electric field is a log Lipschitz electric field. So as it is now, we don't have a clean ground wall estimate. So we cannot expect to, to be set for a time that is uh, log theta. So we, we, we still lose this square root of log theta somewhere. So this is uh, a very general um, discussion about stability estimates. Let me conclude by saying that for the quasi-neutral limit, the right quantity to consider is um, epsilon minus two log of QOT. And by using this, this new quantity, um, I can obtain um, a new result that is uh, essentially the same result as I had to Daniel and Kwan. But now in two and three dimension, I end up with uh, having to require only an exponential control at time zero. That is essentially what, what I wish to have. Uh, since this result is very recent, I still don't know how much I can improve the VPME case by using these techniques. This is something I'm working on still also with the uh, Megan Griffin Pickering. And we will have to, to see how far we can push this. But this method is quite flexible and has other applications. So for example, it can be used to, to improve other classical uh, stability estimates like the Bruchin estimates or some arguments in um, hypocursivity. So, and this is essentially what I wanted to say. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Michaela. Um, first, are there any questions in the room if the host? Uh... Uh, hi, Michaela. Maybe I, I will ask a question then, hi, Benjamin. Benjamin. Um, so, so you talk about the Brazil person. The Brazo Poisson equation, uh, can you, is it possible, are a model like this also in the quantum setting? So you would replace it with some kind of nonlinear Schrodinger equation or Hart equation? Too? Um, I mean, yes, in the sense that the Blasio Poisson equation is linked to quantum models. For example, Chiara, of course, of course spoke about that a couple of days ago. Uh, in particular, this, this approach that uh, I introduced. Um, using these uh, kinetic passes and distances can be declined, I believe, I've not yet done it because it's very recently, in the quantum setting, because recently Francois Goltz and Clément Moore and uh, Thierry Paul, I, I believe, uh, introduced this um, kind of monch kantorovich quantum distance. So they prove some results a la Dubrushin, but since in my paper I improve exactly Dubrushin, making it optimal for, um, for some potentials that are small, I think that uh, by working in that notation that I still have to, to check, uh, I could also improve these kind of um, estimates in the quantum Monch Kantorovich. So, yes. Thanks. Are there other questions here? I don't see other questions from the room. Uh, I have a very silly question. So, in the result, you had a difference between in dimension one and dimensions two and higher. I, I couldn't see in the sketch of the proof where it comes from. Uh, where it comes from, what the difference yeah, like between the one dimension case and... Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. In 1D, we add a better stability estimate that ah. was uh, proved by Ore in Bastestein 1. 
Okay. So okay. in one D, we have a, a, a weak, strong stability estimates that allow us not to have this double exponential. But okay. in dimension two and higher, we, we, we cannot have that uh, yet. I don't know, maybe we can still improve. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Michaela, for the talk. And Thanks a lot. For, and the last speaker of today's session is uh, Sam Function Smith. And Sam is uh, from Brown. And he will tell us about scalar mixing and the bachelor spectrum in fluid dynamics. And Sam, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation as well. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be speaking here. Um, before I start, hopefully uh, the, the sounds with the insects and the birds and everything aren't too loud. Great. Um, you know, okay. So right, I'm gonna be talking about um, uh, scalar mixing and, and bachelor spectrum in stochastic fluid mechanics. Um, I should start by saying, you know, that I'm going to be talking about a, a series of like four works with um, uh, collaborators, Jacob Adroshan and Alex Blumenthal. Um, so I will be covering quite a lot of stuff and, you know, as a result, probably not in as much detail as, as maybe I would have liked, but I suppose that's how it goes. Um, the, you know, just, just to get right off from the start, we're basically just going to be studying two equations. Um, you know, okay, well, there's, there's other equations that we can consider, but to fix ideas, we're just going to be considering advection diffusion equation. So just linear transport on uh, the two-dimensional torus. Um, so specifically, you know, we have some kind of passive scalar density, which is being advected by um, some incompressible velocity field, which is, um, you know, as regular as you, as you like, with some degree of molecular diffusion, and then some source term which is sort of replenishing the scalar. Um, now, in particular, you know, you know, specifically in applications uh, in fluid mechanics, we're interested in the case when the velocity field actually solves uh, a fluid equation. So, in particular, you know, if you like, um, think of the velocity field as actually solving the Navier-Stokes equations. So, this is, in fact, one of the reasons you know why I'm restricting myself to two dimensions. Um, but in fact, much of what I'm going to talk about is not particularly dimension dependent. And I will talk about just a little bit later um, some of the things that you can do if you want to extend uh, the, the dimensionality. Of course, you can't really do three-dimensional Navier-Stokes, but there are other models you can consider. Okay, so if we take Navier-Stokes and this advection diffusion equation, um, we force both of them. And I'll talk a little bit more about these forcing. So we have a body force on the Navier-Stokes equations and then the source term. And essentially, you know, we're, we're interested in the long time behavior of these things. Um, and the, just to sort of ensure that we have some kind of non steady state or some, some nice um, long time behavior, which is um, well defined. Okay, and in particular, if the forcings are stochastic, um, you can say quite a lot about the long time behavior. So in particular, we're interested in, in what scalar, um, you know, essentially that even though the equation uh, for the scalar is linear and very simple, it, it obviously is sort of um, slave to the evolution of the velocity field. And in particular, it can uh, display very complicated behavior as you send time to infinity. Okay, so the scalar often gets really tangled up in the velocity field. Um, you, you have mixing effects, which I'll talk about. Um, and then, you know, Basically, you get these very complicated patterns that emerge. Um, so, you know, something I like to call Swiss roll structures. Um, in particular, if you're if you're constantly replenishing the scalar with some large scale source, they kind of all layer on top of each other, and you get pictures that kind of look like this. Now, this picture is actually just a picture that you get if you ink, you know, white and black together, indicative of the kind of um, structures you see. Um, and, and this sort of really complicated mess, um, at least in, in sort of physics literature, is referred to as passive scalar turbulence. It's very multi-scale, um, and, and it has a lot of um, structure to it, and it's very complicated. Um, now, in general, I mean, as with other forms of turbulence, um, these complicated patterns um, actually often exhibit kind of a, a clean universal statistical structure, or at least a certain range of scales. Particularly, like in, in a steady state, 
or you know think of uh, in some 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 kind of equilibrium so when i say steady state I, I mean like a statistical steady state so it can change in time but it reaches a state where its sort of statistics don't change in time um, physicists and, and engineers often are very interested in, in what's known as power spectra so at least on the torus um, this is this is what happens if i take the fourier transform of, of the scalar or and the velocity field, let's say, and I just look at how the energy, so that particularly for the for the velocity field and navier Stokes equations, I look at how the energy is distributed over frequencies on average. Okay, um, at least in, in sort of energy shells, uh, and so or frequency shells, and so th this function is often referred to as a, as a power spectra or power spectral density, um, and, and in particular, you know, in in many circumstances of interest, at least over a certain range of scales, certain universal power laws emerge. Um, so in particular, you can think of, you know, uh, they're usually negative power laws. So as frequency increases, the uh, amount of energy or, or particularly for the scalar, think of it as L2 energy or something like that. Or, um, you know, if you want to think of it as vorticity, you can think of it as, as um, uh, entropy or, or sort of uh, vorticity, sorry. Then, uh, you know, the, these power laws that emerge actually indicate that there's a really rough um, nature or something really rough happening. And it's, you know, a statement about on average, what's the regularity, um, which is kind of a hallmark of turbulence. So a really famous example of this, at least in 3D, is, is Kolmogorov's uh, sort of famous negative five thirds law uh, for, for the 3D Navier-Stokes equations, which, which of course has not been proven rigorously, but it is observed um, more or less Experiments um, and anywhere. So, just to give you a picture of, of the thing I'm talking about here, um, if I if I look at sort of a diagram, particularly a log log plot of the frequency versus the power spectrum, um, there are several regimes that come out. Now, what we're what I'm going to talk about is just uh, what's referred to as the Bachelor regime. So, this is a regime where um, where basically you fix the Reynolds number or you fix sort of a regularity parameter on the on the velocity field that you're looking at. And then you, you take kappa really, really small. So the, the molecular diffusion on the um, on the advection diffusion equation, you shrink it really small and you and you try to understand how the frequencies are distributed in a certain range that uh, is referred to as the viscous convective range. So this is a range uh, of frequencies, which is essentially below the dissipative scale for the fluid equation. So, you know, for the Navier-Stokes equations, um, but then, uh, you know, above the, um, the sort of uh, parabolic regularity cutoff for, um, for the advection diffusion equation. So in fact, it, it's just from, just from parabolic regularity, it's not hard to show that um, the kappa to the minus one half is kind of the natural um, cutoff scale that you get there. So just in this picture, what we see here is that we have a, a series of scales um, Li, we call the integral scale, and, and this is typically a scale that you're sort of injecting um, either energy or, um, or sort of L2 scalar. Uh, you know, kind of anything here it really depends on the nature of the forcing that you're using. Um, so you don't really care about what's going on in here. Um, however, you know, typically after everything sort of settles, as you sort of uh, um, go up in frequency or, or down in scale, uh, you get... Um, some sort of, and, and this picture I'm showing here is again for, for 3D Navier-Stokes, 2D Navier-Stokes and other things are complicated. You can try to draw analogous pictures, but um, you know, as you may know that in, in two dimensions, um, there's sort of a, a dual cascade, which can kind of muddy this picture up. In particular, 3D Navier-Stokes equations here, um, <clears throat> since I'm looking on log log plot, they have a power law and it comes out as a slope that's roughly minus five thirds. And, and what happens is the scalar kind of mirrors that. Okay, so that the scalar actually ends up picking roughly the same um, regularity as the, uh, um, as the energy of the velocity field. However, once you go below the, the, the dissipative range for the fluid, it sort of tapers off and becomes relatively smooth. You start to see uh, uh, a roughening of the scalar. So in particular, the scalar, as a little, uh, and you end up with a slope of minus one, uh, which is Bachelor's uh, prediction. So you know, essentially, what he says is that um, in in this kind of regime where where the fluid is really regular, uh, you get this kind of universal um, 
parallel, but uh, it actually ends up roughening. Um, and this is what we're going to be interested in. This is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, by the way, hopefully cutting out or anything, I, I just got a, a notification that my, my internet was um, being a little bit unstable. Um, if, if you can't hear me, maybe I can try to um, move or something. But So we can out. hear you, but sometimes it is true that it jumps a bit. So you should, um, but, but so far it was okay. Okay, okay. If, if it gets really bad, just interrupt me and, and I can try to um, move. Okay. So, um, you know, I want to remark the uh, Bachelor originally made his prediction that it's been observed a large number of times, um, not just in nature, but also in sort of very controlled lab experiments, numerical simulations. Um, here, I'll just show you, I mean, one, one of the most prominent places is observed, for instance, is in the upper ocean, in both uh, small temperature and salinity variations. And you can see this is a, is a real natural version of the picture that I uh, just showed up here. And, you know, you see that, you know, you have kind of a five thirds law going up here, and then all of a sudden there's this kink and you have um, bachelor spectrum over here. Okay, so it's been known since Bachelor made his prediction that it shows up all over the place. Um, it has a very universal characters, at least within sort of the regime of, of uh, suitably regular flows. And, and I'm gonna give you just a really rough idea of how Bachelor made his argument um, because the heuristic is actually very enlightening. So essentially the idea goes like this, Bachelor, um, he said that, okay, if you look small enough, um, everything looks linear, although, you know, that's sort of debatable. And particularly, he said that if you if you zoom in close enough, uh, let's just approximate flow with a pure straining flow. And when I say pure straining flow, I mean um, basically a saddle flow. Okay, so it has, uh, it's a linear flow on, on R2 now, let's say, where the matrix has eigenvalues, which are just um, plus or minus gamma, where, where gamma is positive. Okay, so it has some sort of stable compression, unstable axis. Um, and for linear velocity fields like this, um, it's quite easy to show that, that for the advection diffusion equation, if I were to choose um, a source term, which is um, supported on a large scale frequency and then sort of modulated by some Brownian motion. So this is a sort of a white in time Brownian motion. Then you can, you can write an exact uh, statistically stationary solution because essentially it sends Fourier modes to Fourier modes. Um, and you get a solution that looks like this. Okay, so this is sort of a, a random variable that describes sort of how the how the scalar is layered on. Um, and if you try to look uh, basically at, at you know, the, this, this frequency CT is something that is, um, it's basically just the matrix exponential of A uh, and, it, and it grows exponentially fast. Okay, so you end up with an exponential frequency cascade. Um, and, and, you know, there's a nice picture you can imagine with this, right? Is if I basically take something which is varying like this with some large scale variations, um, the frequency cascade is happening on the, on the um, stable direction, okay? So as everything kind of squishes in, you get an increase in frequency and it, and it happens exponentially mm -hmm. fast. Now, because of this exponential frequency cascade, um, within that time integral, it takes roughly log n time to reach frequency n. Um, and, and sort of from that, you can see that, well, um, therefore the amount of, um, uh, L2 mass, scalar mass, below frequency n has to be approximately log n. And in fact, uh, you can be a little bit more precise from this. From the formula I gave above, it's not too hard to deduce an exact rigorous asymptotic for the power spectral density, which you know, can be seen as the, um, the sort of flux through, uh, through scale n as something that looks like this, at least when, when you take n large. So in fact, this is a one over n. So this is Bachelor's prediction with a, a correction that sort of says, um, that really kicks in once you um, reach, once you go past the dissipative scale. Okay, so despite this really simple heuristic, which is actually completely rigorous uh, for linear flows, um, and the fact that it's observed everywhere, of course, for flows that are not necessarily linear, um, there's been essentially no rigorous proofs of Batchelor's uh, law beyond these simple linear flows. Um, and, and in fact, it, it's because it's extremely challenging to do for flows that are, that are um, even a little bit more complicated than linear. Um, so what we're gonna do and what I'm gonna um, focus on is specifically on the case when, when the velocity fields are random. So this is um, uh, particularly gonna be done with stochastic forcing. So specifically, you know, it's been known for, for quite a while that, you know, for instance, with the introduction of the Kreikman model um, uh, there's other versions of things like this too, 
uh, although Kraken is, is sort of white in time velocity fields, um, that things can be much more tractable if you introduce sort of Gaussian randomness. Okay, so similar ideas have actually been done, for instance, in the context of the fast dynamo problem, which is, you know, vector detection problem um, by, by uh, Zeldovich, uh, Ruzmaik, and Molchanov, and, and Sokolov, uh, where they also kind of consider uh, random velocity fields and are able to actually say things that you essentially would not be able to say in the deterministic setting. So particularly in, in this case, I'm going to consider uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, but forced by something by forcing, which is white in time, um, colored in space. Okay, so imagine the the forcing that I'm taking is sort of a it's a sum of Brownian motions, uh, let's say um, independent Brownian motions. Um, these EKs are just Stokes eigenfunctions, and and the QKs are some sort of coloring coefficient which I'm going to assume sort of have a power law associated with them. Okay, so they not only are, do they decay like, like k to the minus alpha, where k is basically the frequency, but they also um, don't decay any faster than that. Okay, and here I'm going to assume alpha is bigger than, than d over 2, and this basically ensures that the, that the forcing is Sobolev regular. Um, and in fact, you know, you know, it gives me well posedness for the, for the stochastic Navier-Stokes equations, it gives me enough regularity to make sense um, of, um, you know, solutions uh, to, or at least flows or, or something like that for the velocity field. Um, and I want to mention, sorry, that the, the non-degeneracy requirement here is actually very crucial to our work. I won't really be able to go into too much detail about it, but it's a technical requirement to give um, what's known as a strong Feller property for a UT. And currently it, it cannot be removed without significant, like, um, advances basically in the field of um, infinite dimensional regularity for Kolmogorov equations. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to mention that, that the, the, the noise is assumed to be uh, non-degenerate. Um, and here's just a, a very brief uh, discussion here. You don't have to just consider Navier-Stokes. In fact, a lot of what we're talking about is not particularly special in Navier-Stokes because we're, we're going way down into the dissipative range. Um, if you want to work in 3D, you could consider 3D hyperviscous Navier-Stokes or stochastically forced versions. You can take 2D and 3D Stokes or, or uh, 2D and 3D glare truncations of Navier-Stokes, in which case you can actually um, uh, remove the degeneracy or uh, non-degeneracy requirement for the noise. Um, and, and in particular, you know, a nice example of what to think about is you can consider velocity fields, which are just sort of linear combinations of, of shear flows um, in 2D or 3D uh, modulated by independent ornstein uhlenbeck processes. Okay, so these are things that are just sort of randomly sloshing around. And not only that, you don't even have to force with white in time. You, you can force with things which are CK in time. Okay, and so the, the main result uh, is, is basically uh, the following. I mean, we were able to prove um, Bachelor's Law holds in, in sort of a cumulative version. Um, and specifically, it goes like this. If, if I assume that, that I'm forcing my scalar with something which is white in time, Gaussian, you know, that doesn't even have to be the case. Um, supported on suitably large scales, and that UT solves the stochastic Navier-Stokes equations with the forcing that I that I gave you before, then there exists a unique stationary measure for this Markov process, which is in fact not uh, immediately obvious, and there exists sort of a, a you know a cutoff scale such that for all kappa and and for all p that we have something that that is essentially like an integrated version of Bachelor's law. So it says that basically the amount of L2 mass on average and frequencies less than n is supported above and below by log n. Okay, and this is for all n between this range and, and kappa. So this is an estimate that really makes sense for very small kappa. Um, but in fact, you know, it's important to remark that this estimate is uniform in kappa. So these constants here don't depend on kappa. Um, and, and this actually gives you a, not only just a regularity bound, but it, it's really an irregularity bound. Um, so it, it really is saying that this, this equation is, be, is being very rough over these scales. Um, and so th this actually builds on, on a, a number of previous works that we did, which I'll, I'll talk about very briefly, using chaotic mixing properties for, for random velocity fields. Um, so specifically, you know, mixing is actually the, the crucial ingredient. Um, in some sense, you can think about the, the exponential frequency cascade that uh, Batchelor um, in his sort of special uh, linear solutions or solutions for linear velocity fields, um, you know, you can instead sort of replace that. And in general, you know, you don't have um, 
a, a fixed local frequency cascade, but, but you can kind of get around that or, or generalize it, let's say using um, you know, the idea of mixing. So specifically mixing is, is this property that says, well, you know, if I start with a, with a blob of scalar, which is, um, you know, scale one, uh, once it gets all tangled up, it starts to generate small frequencies or sorry, high frequencies. Okay, as, as it gets really filamented like this. Okay, and so this formation of small scales very often happens at an exponential rate. And, and so we say uh, that, that this kind of thing is exponentially mixing if, well, you know, you, you can quantify in, in many ways mixing, although there's, there's a huge number of ways to do this. Also, the massive literature on this, which I, I won't even uh, have close to amount of time to go into. Um, but basically, you know, one of the natural ways to measure um, how mixed something is, at least for mean zero functions, is to, is to measure its H minus one norm, which you can think of as a sort of a length scale that tells you how filamented it is. Okay, and we say that something is exponentially mixing if the H minus one norm decays exponentially fast, at least if I start with initial data that was um, suitably unmixed. Okay, let's say something that was an H1. Um, now, now diffusion actually can have a very complicated effect on mixing. Um, and, you know, I, I won't go into all the subtleties there, but, but in fact, you know, mixing is something that generates high frequencies, um, potentially exponentially fast. And diffusion is something that kind of gobbles up high frequencies. Um, so when you put them together, they, 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 um, they synergize with each other in some ways, but they can also kind of fight each other. Um, and, you know, here, here's a really nice picture I like to show. This is, um, you know, from, from a paper of, of Doring and Miles, where basically, um, you know, they had some very, very specifically constructive velocity fields uh, for the advection diffusion equation. But, you know, they showed that, that if you study something like the H minus one norm, the L2 norm, and the H1 norm, um, here, PE is the Paclay number, which is one over um, kappa. That basically, as you as you send uh, Paclay larger and larger, and okay, that corresponds to taking kappa smaller and smaller, um, you you end up sort of approaching this sort of um, nice behavior, which is basically okay. H minus one norm is decaying. L two norm is becoming conserved, which is what you would expect because it, uh, when kappa is equal to zero, it's just a transport equation. And then the H1 norm ends up blowing up because uh, you know um, you end up producing gradients all over the place. Um, however, because you have diffusion on it, uh, the second you add a little bit of diffusion, this becomes a transient phenomenon. Um, and so the H minus one norm decays, but then it reaches sort of a, a, an asymptotic line. L2 norm remains roughly constant and then it starts to decay. And the H1 norm starts to blow up, then it gets arrested and then ends up decaying. And all these rates actually end up being the same thing. Um, this is something that you can actually prove, although um, it's, it's at the moment it's a um, uh, work in progress. Um, however, so basically one of the, the fundamental ingredients uh, and pieces that we have, um, you know, I'd say in, in some sense of just interest by itself is that, okay, if you take the Navier-Stokes equation, um, you know, let, let's say you, you, you set the source equal to zero so that the, the advection diffusion equation is decaying, for instance, in just L2, if you take the Navier-Stokes equations with this non-degenerate stochastic forcing, then it exponentially mixes um, almost surely with respect to the noise uh, for, for the Navier-Stokes equations. So specifically, and not only that, but it actually um, does it uniformly in kappa. Okay, and that's actually something you can see from this picture here. Um, the second I add kappa to it, it actually just increases the rate of mixing. It doesn't slow it down. Um, and so this is essentially what we proved, all right, is that um, you know, you, you consider this thing, you have almost sure exponential mixing. There is a random constant here that comes out that depends on the initial data for Navier-Stokes and noise. Um, and it does, in some sense, depend on kappa, although it has average that don't depend on kappa. This, this uniform and kappa mixing is, is actually extremely um, strong. And, and I have to say, it's, it's a, to my knowledge, it's the first rigorous example of actually a, a velocity field that mixes uniformly in kappa except for besides linear flows. Um, and, and I want to just mention exactly how, how strong it is. So if you have the fast, it's actually quite easy to show just by very simple energy argument that um, you, you get sort of optimal enhanced dissipation. So basically that, that you, know, you, you know that if you, optimal in terms of the time scale at least, you know that if the, the L2 norm is going to decay um, just by the heat equation in general, 
However, if you if you have mixing, you know, as I mentioned, that you kind of feed energy in, um, into the Laplacian, which is going to make it decay even faster. And so what you can show directly from, from that estimate is that you actually get sort of a, an L2 decay estimate that looks like this. Um, and, and maybe it's easier to unpack this a little bit using a little bit of, um, let's say, just parabolic regularity. Um, and if you take time long enough, you can show that this implies the following sort of enhanced um, L2 dissipation estimate where, where you have exponential decay that, that is happening on a log kappa time scale as opposed to, to something that looks like a, a one over kappa time scale that you would expect with the heat equation. Okay, and, and, and this log kappa time scale you can prove is, is optimal. Um, and, and in fact, you know, there, there's been a ton of works. Again, I, I won't go into, into the details of this particular velocity fields. Um, and, and in fact, as far as I know, um, all the techniques require um, or, or are not able to obtain optimal time scale. So I think the best that you can get is something like log kappa squared, although there may be some, some slight improvements on that. Okay, so in, in the time that's remaining, I'm gonna talk about how it's proved. Um, the techniques here are not extremely PDE based. In fact, they're, they're very dependent on dynamical systems. So I, I imagine that some of, um, some of you may not be fully familiar with the techniques used, but you know, I'll do my best to, to um, give you uh, at least some idea of how they're proved. So first, I, I just wanna tell you that you know, the, the biggest enemy here, and particularly with Navier-Stokes, and the reason that makes Navier-Stokes so hard, even though you know, we are working below the dissipative scale, is that um, you know, in two dimensions, for instance, Navier-Stokes, we're, we're able to fix the Reynolds number, but it can be really small. It, it produces a mess and, and it has tons of coherent structures in it. So these little um, vortices all over the place. So in particular, you know, these vortices, they, um, they stop mixing um, and, or at least, you know, not, not very fast. And in many cases, you can kind of see here that all those, you know, we're, we're actually looking at the vorticity being infected by um, the velocity field here. Um, within the vortices, you know, the, the vorticity kind of gets trapped. And so a large part of what we're trying to do and, and fight here is, is, is the fact that, you know, th this can't happen forever. There's all kinds of obstructions that can stop you from and actually achieving batch spectrum uniformly. Okay, and so as I mentioned, I'm basically using ideas um, from actually the random dynamics community. Um, and, and particularly, it's really a Lagrangian perspective on everything. So the idea is that you know, we, we want to study the chaotic mixing properties of, of, of the Lagrangian flow map associated with velocity. And in order to represent the Laplacian in the advection diffusion equation, at least without a source term, um, we add a, a Kappa Brownian motion to it. Okay, so I look at this SDE and I look at its uh, stochastic flow of diffeomorphisms. And, you know, it's, it's well known that, that um, I represent the solution to the scalar equation like this, just by sort of composing or pushing forward an initial density under the flow and then averaging it over, over all the Brownian motions. Okay, and, and our aim here is actually, step one is to show that this flow has a positive Lyapunov exponent. Essentially that, that if, I, if I linearize the flow or take the, take the derivative of the flow um, and look at its asymptotic exponential growth rate, that that's positive. And that implies a whole bunch of things. I mean, the, there's an enormous, enormous literature. I mean, if, if you went to any of the dynamical systems um, sessions um, you know, earlier in the conference talks on this stuff. Um, it, you know, there's enormous literature on this and it implies a lot. I mean, it, it implies sort of an instability um, of the equation and implies what's known as, um, you know, a form of hyperbolicity. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but in, in the random setting, there's a lot of um, techniques that we can use to sort of prove something like this. Although in general, it's notoriously difficult to prove that a system has a positive Lyapunov exponent. So here, our strategy uh, is a lift the process um, or, or basically I take the particle or think of a Lagrangian particle moving in the flow and then I augment it with something that tracks its tangent directions uh, or at least the linearized tra tra uh, tangent directions. So this is often we refer to this as the projective process but you can think of this in, in geometric terms as something that just lifts um, a process up to the sphere bundle. And then we look at this thing and, and we show that actually, if I look at the, the fluid equation plus a particle plus this, um, this projective process, this is a Markov process and it has a unique stationary measure. Now that by itself is actually already uh, kind of challenging because things are quite degenerate. 
So, you know, it, it uses, although, you know, it uses machinery that, that's fairly well developed uh, due to higher and Mattingly. Um, and now from, from random dynamics, we can show that, you know, if I look at the, the regular conditional measures, that is, I look at measures on the, on the sphere conditioned on, on the initial velocity field and where the particle is, that there's this well-known, at least in certain communities, relative entropy um, lower bound on, on the Lyapunov exponent. Okay, so there's the relative entropy between these two measures. Um, and, and this basically says that, all right, well, if, if lambda is equal to zero, then these two things, this measure and this measure have to be equal. Uh, and they have to be equal for all time and for all noise um, paths. And so basically, if you can show that there is a, a positive probability set such that they're not equal, then, then you're basically done, at least in terms of showing that there's a positive exponent. And so, so that's what we do. I mean, using techniques, you know, although it's, it's, not, it's not simple by any means, using techniques from geometric control theory for fluid mechanics and, um, and basically uh, group theory as well, we can show that there is a positive probability set such that these two measures, you know, a positive uh, set of noise trajectories such that, that these two measures are not equal, okay, for at least some time. I'm sorry, these should be ut and um, xt here. Okay, and so th this goes under the name often as a uh, Furstenberg rigidity idea. So it basically says that if, if you, the only way you can not have a positive Lyapunov exponent is if there are certain rigid, almost surely invariant structures uh, that are preserved by the by this linearization. Okay, and, and basically, you know, how do you use a positively output of exponent where, well, um, the idea here is that exponential mixing, which is sort of the key ingredient for getting Bachelor's Law, is actually implied by what's known in quench correlation decay. So particularly, if I look at the correlation or the, or the covariance between F composed with the flow and G, if this thing decays almost surely exponentially fast, um, then this is actually equivalent to um, H minus one decay just by duality. Okay, and so if I can show almost sure or quench correlation decay, that implies exponential um, mixing. Okay, and it, it's well known in dynamics that quench correlation decay comes from, at least in many cases, comes from hyperbolicity or, or chaos, more or less. Okay, and so, you know, essentially the, the trick here is to show that, you know, there's a borel cantelli argument, which basically says that if I look at the, um, you know, the probability that, that my um, covariance doesn't decay exponentially fast, well, I can, you know, just do um, Chebyshev and, and double the variables, and I can bound this by sort of a two-point Markov semigroup. If, if I look at two particle trajectories enforced by the same noise, um, that, that I look at the, the evolution of this process, if this thing decays exponentially fast, then this decays exponentially fast. And by Borel Cantelli, um, you know, because the series is summable, um, I can, you know, the, the opposite has to happen, at least if I wait long enough in time. So, so I end up actually getting exponential decay. All right. So, so basically, you know, the, the whole point of, the, of this is to show that this two point Markov semi group is decaying exponentially fast, which in, um, in Markov semi group terms is known as uh, geometric ergodicity. Okay, and, and, and we show that this is geometrically ergodic uniformly in kappa using a, a Harris theorem framework. Um, the, you know, framework of initially developed by Mine and Tweedy, but in, improved by Heyer and Mattingly. Essentially, it involves finding a Lyapunov function and satisfying a minorization condition. Um, how much time do I have? I, th I think I'm essentially out of time. Yeah, you're a bit out, a bit out of time. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Uh, basically, I'll I'll just uh, I'll wrap it up here. But um, you know, essentially, everything comes down to finding um, a, a very carefully constructed Lyapunov function, um, which which we can do by um, by spectral perturbation techniques. Okay, um, and of course, I I don't have time to go into it. That's fine. Um, so here are the papers in case anyone's interested. And um, yeah, thanks for your time. Are there any questions in the room? No, I don't see question. Well, I, ha I have a question, Sam, which I always wondered. Um, so when you have the passive scalar, um, the L2 norm is, I mean, so you're basically estimating piece order moments of the L2 norm of the scalar. And the L2 norm is, is one of the norms, I mean, 
LQ norms might as well uh, be taken. And there's this whole obukov corsin theory about what happens to the Hölder scale. Do, mm -hmm. do your results um, in, in automatically imply something in that direction, or could they be used to say something in that direction? And uh, not that I know of. I mean, it's something that I've I've thought about for quite a while, but um, it's it's not clear how to do anything like that. I mean, uh, a number of reasons. I mean, just come down to sort of um, uh, optimal, you know, regularity estimates on stochastic integrals. Um, but but moreover, I mean, a part of it is because um, mixing is kind of naturally described in an L two scale, um, and and the you know, it, it already makes sense that sort of the bachelor's law actually says something about like a, a Besov type regularity, sure. um, but it's not actually saying any, it's, that's not even easy to make precise um, because, because it's being averaged. So you might be tempted to say that like on average, the, the scaler is going to be um, living in some, in some Besov space related to some, you know, logarithmic um, regularity parameter, but, but even that is not easy to get a handle on. So I, you know, to answer your question, I, I don't know how to work outside of L2 for... Um, but the reasons uh, are, if I understand properly, the reasons are stochastic in nature, this L2 framework. Um, yes, I mean, you know, I, I think there are ways to, to get around it. Um, you know, there basically there's a lot of obstructions to applying like Edo formula and BDG inequality um, in spaces that are... You can do LP, but... Um, you know, it becomes rather tricky and, and there's all sorts of obstructions that, that you can run into. Uh, although, you know, I'd be, I'd be hesitant to say that they're, that it's, the obstructions are purely stochastic in nature. Um, it's just that I don't, I don't know how to get past them. <laughs> sure, sure. This is a very hard problem. And I hope yeah. that you guys are going to solve it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been working on it. I don't know how to do it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sam, for the beautiful talk. And I would occasionally like to thank the local organizers for putting all of this together. It must have been very difficult to combine. Thank you for person. your work, uh, Vlad, and also to Lars, of course. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks. Well, thank you to time. all speakers, also, of course. And thank you to all the speakers, and have a good weekend and the rest of the summer, the little that's left of it. Great. Bye-bye.